Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Paduan, live from a recording studio in Lausanne. Quick thanks to our sponsor, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation and the International Federation of Automatic Control. You heard that correctly, we're in uh, Lausanne, we're not playing home this time, but we're in the neighboring uh, French-speaking side of Switzerland for a nice event which brought together some of the most brilliant minds out there in control and machine learning, namely the NCCR Symposium. There will be a link in the description. Our guest today is Jean-Jacques Slotin, Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Information Sciences, as well as Professor of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and Director of the Nonlinear System Laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, Distinguished Faculty at Google AI. Welcome to the show, Jean-Jacques. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here, and we're honored that you're actually accepted to be on the show. Um, maybe to break the ice, I would like to know something about you uh, as a person. So what do you like to do in the first six minutes of your uh, days? Like, what's your routine? Do you have anything specific? Wake up slowly, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you know, no, I don't have a specific routine, you know, so uh, it's... Uh, Maybe if you want some background, so I'm French, you know, and uh, and I moved to the U.S. Uh, to to do my uh, to do my PhD actually, and so um, yeah, that, that's actually something that was uh, interesting for me. So you were born in uh, Paris, yeah, and uh, so I was wondering whether where you grew up affected you in some way as a, a researcher, not only as a person, somehow. Yeah, I, I feel very French, and in a sense, uh, I uh, you know. It used to be maybe a little less so now, but the, the, the French training in, in mathematics was really strong, much stronger than in the U.S. And so, uh, so when I did my PhD in the U.S., I never thought of staying there. You know? So, uh, but uh, but of course, you know, places like MIT are, are meeting places, are places where some of the best students of the world come, and and uh, and a lot of them are not Americans. Actually, a lot of them are from. Uh, many many countries and uh and it's a wonderful place because of that you know mm -hmm. and uh so what happened is actually I, I finished my phd very young i was 23 and so instead of coming back to france immediately uh, i was offered a position at bell labs after a while you know i should have to try that and then i was offered a position at mit and then i said i have to try that and then uh, ended up staying in the US, but was, that was never the plan. You know, so. Actually, this is something that I had read in the, your biography and I wanted to clarify. You got your PhD at 23. Yes, that's right. <laughs> how, how did that happen? I mean, uh, uh, well, it, started, uh, it started very young, you know, basically when I was an only child, which I hated. And so my, my mother, you know, taught me to read and write. And so I ended up skipping classes, which, you know, my parents and I actually were not particularly keen on. But uh, you know, and so I ended up doing a very, uh, doing everything quite young, you know. And I also I did my PhD quite quickly, you know. So that's uh, that's quite interesting. I mean, we could arguably say that you were a, a child prodigy, and also working in places like Bell Labs uh, must have been an incredible. Experience. Oh yeah, Bell Labs was a fantastic place. Uh, it was. Uh, it was really you. You came, and it was Bell Lab Research, of course, and you came, and they said. Uh, you know, we hired you because we think you're good, uh, uh, as everybody else, right? And uh, we won't ask you for five years, anything for five years, right? Basically, you do whatever you want, you know, you can have computers, you can have, uh, uh, you know, at the time, you know, you, you could have computers at home was a big luxury. Uh, you could have anything, uh, but they wouldn't ask you anything for five years. So, and it was, and of course, everybody was working like crazy, but I thought it was a really, really nice Wow, uh, so complete way. freedom and yeah. and creativity essentially yeah. was unleashed. Yeah, and actually that's a message I try to uh, give to whenever I meet somebody reasonably high up at Google, you know, because uh, I think uh, Bell Labs is in part one of the models for Google. For me, Google is a wonderful place. It's a mixture of Bell Labs and Club Med. You know? uh, and uh, and I think uh, with the, the best of both, uh, but they... Uh, they care much more about evaluations and so on, and uh, uh, they changed that a little recently. And I think you know one one of the strengths of Bell Labs is that you you took really good people and we and you set them completely free, and you never bothered them for for a long time. Actually, you know, you never ask you know reports and things like that for a long time. 
And this is something that I wanted to ask you later, but maybe it's, uh, this is already a good time to ask. Uh, so what are your thoughts about creativity somehow? So if you have any. Uh... Oh, it's a broad question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I think I... I guess the expression is I do my best thinking, whatever that's worth. But, you know, just uh, walking around without, uh, you know, uh, without notes, without a board, uh, just walking around. And I think it's very, uh, you know, when people ask uh, about uh, how can they make uh, doing math a little easier, I always say, you know, just practice doing math without a board, without a pen, without anything, because you, you get quicker at certain things this way. It's very uh, interesting, though, that uh, it's not the first time that I hear, you know, uh, one of the great thinkers that, you know, stim what stimulates, uh, seems to stimulate at least creativity is walking. Yeah, Somehow you know, yeah walking definitely, but walking definitely, but also the fact of not uh, doing everything in your head, you know, because th then you, I don't know, it probably trains memory or whatever, but it, uh, it, it really helps do things afterwards. I find it very, very interesting. Uh, but maybe let's go back to like the chronology, if you want, of uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Solotine. So um, I was wondering what has drawn you to control? Uh, well, you know, uh, when I was a kid, like everybody, I was reading cartoons, you know, and uh, there was one cartoon, which I didn't read much because I didn't like it very much, but which I think was in, in English was Flash Gordon. And, you know, I think there were better French cartoons and so on, so I didn't, uh, but uh, uh, they talked about cybernetics, you know, and uh, for me, I was four or five years old, you know, so it so, so, so sounded like an interesting word, you know, and so... And I wondered about that, and then I learned more about cybernetics, and and I figured out this was an interesting thing. You know, I read about the, uh, Norbert Wiener and all, all uh, you know, Norbert Wiener, which was really a, a precursor, right? Uh, the, uh, if you think of uh, this, the, his book, you know, it's uh, science of control and communication in human and machine. You know, you, you wouldn't say it any differently today, really. Uh, you know, it has control, it has communication, and it has this commonality between, you know, biology and uh, machine, right? So uh, it's an incredibly fascinating topic. And actually, it was the subject of our last episode in this podcast, probably not the not the last one on, on Wiener, but... Uh, and, you know, so, so this whole, you know, cybernetics is really the the common ancestor, you know, of course, of control theory, uh, uh, information theory, but of course also computational neuroscience and AI, right? So it's, uh, and robotics, right? So it's, it's the common ancestor of all of these things, right? It's incredible and, that uh, it was condensed uh, in a single figure like Wiener. Was uh, just oh, no, a, it was not condensed. It was, it was lots, lots, I'm saying Wiener, when he wrote his book, you know, the title of his book was so incredible, right? Because it's so current still, you know, mm -hmm. but there were other people, you know, uh, Gray, uh, you know, uh, Shannon was involved in people like that, but uh, Gray Walter uh, mm -hmm. was, uh, he is actually the first person who did real robots, you know, he, he built these little autonomous robots uh, which uh, kind of moved around, avoided each other, went to plug themselves into the wall when they were running out of power, and they learned, they learned a lot of things, and that was in the late 40s, right, in the late 1940s. And Gray Walter was actually a neurologist, that was just a hobby for him, right? He was actually a neurologist, and uh, and he built these first robots and so on. And actually, one of the f he wrote these two famous papers in Scientific American, probably 1949, 1950, or something like that, which uh, one was called an, an Imitation of Life, and the other one was uh, called A Machine That Learns. And the I think the first or second paper finishes with the uh, with the quote saying, you know, one. Uh, one limit of basically he was building these little uh, electronic neurons right and he was saying you know one limit uh, you, you can predict with confidence that what would limit things as you try to scale up is stability uh it was really interesting that he that says you know it's, as, as as you're going to put more and more of these things it is is going to be stability and then since he was british he added the joke saying you know then therefore it's not uh, it's not surprising that most smart people are also crazy or something like that you know but but, uh, uh, but it was uh, it was kind of uh, it was quite interesting so this whole it, it's kind of incredible what happened there just after the second world war right so incredibly early in in history yeah yeah um, okay, so from here, I guess we can take many different directions. So uh, we can either talk about one of your biggest ideas, and that's, I would say, contraction among others, uh, or let's say take a chronological path, if you want. I thought it would be, I don't know, curious, at least from my perspective, to 
give an overview of your research. So you started really from motivated by robotic applications, essentially. No, I started motivated by uh, trying to do nonlinear control. Okay. Nonlinear control. Uh, control for nonlinear mm-hmm. systems, you know. Uh, I had had a teacher when I was in France who named André Fossard, and at the time he was very familiar with research done in the then Soviet Union. And they mm-hmm. had a particular way to do a kind of nonlinear control which seemed to me very promising. And that was citing mode control. But it had this problem that it had chattering, and, and they were not actually using for nonlinear control, they were using for linear control, but it it was it could reasonably easily be uh, extended to that. And uh, um, and so, you know, so I started being interesting in in you know you know, applying this to nonlinear control and uh, getting rid of the, the chattering thing and so on. But I quickly realized that uh, one of the key thing, uh, so that's getting a little technical depending on your audience, but you take an nth order system, it's a system def- described by a differential equation of nth order. So uh, if it was a second order system, it would be like position and velocity. And you can always replace this nth order problem by a first order problem. And that was really the key idea. Everything else was technicalities. And because that was the key idea, it could be extended to nonlinear systems. It could be made uh, that the the chattering, uh, you could get rid of this uh, switching and, and things like that. And so, and it's, and the reason, getting back to Norbert Wiener, uh, the reason is that when Norbert Wiener explains in his book, what feedback is about, he says, well, you know, if you're trying to grab a cup and you're a little too much to the right, uh, you're, uh, you, uh, you go to the left and you're a little too much to the left, you go to the right and you end up grabbing the cup. Or, you know, if, um, if uh, your uh, uh, niece uh, keeps asking you, uh, you know, why you, I hear uh, always to talk, you talking about feedback, you know, you'll probably say something similar. And you're completely misleading that child. It's completely wrong that if you're too much to the left, you go, you need to go to the right. And you're too much to the right, you need to go to the left. That's completely wrong. But it's true if it's the system is first order. Okay. So the idea is that replacing always a system, an nth order system by a first order system, creates an enormous simplification in everything, basically, which later on allows to do adaptive control, adaptive nonlinear control, and so on. Okay. Yeah, I just want to situate maybe the motivation for uh, sliding mode control. I guess here we're back in the 80s, pretty much mm-hmm. 80s, between the 80s and the 90s. And I guess there there were there was an interest at least in control for robotic applications for manipulators. Mm-hmm, and that was mm-hmm. based on feedback linearization mostly, yep, I yep. suppose. So that means that via feedback, we were able to change the dynamics, put it into a, a linear form, and then somehow simplify both analysis and design. The problem with uh, feedback linearization was that it is based on uh, exact cancellation of nonlinearities, and therefore uh, there was a need for robust methods. And uh, sliding mode control was definitely one solution. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it allowed to do things uh, reasonably simply. You know, I, I always, uh, you know, even people joke about that. I, I always tend to say, you know, it's very simple. You know, I, I want to try to make things very simple. You know, and so. Uh, to, to get to get to the core idea and st- stick to to very simple things, and uh, and of course you know when we say my ideas you know I worked with many people advisors and especially students you know and and a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, these were ideas that everybody brought you know so. yeah in in those days when you were doing your PhD at MIT there were incredible minds like uh, uh, Sanjay Mitter uh, or Shankar Sastri right yeah I talked to a lot of people my my advisor was uh, Wally Van de Velde at uh, in Aaron Astro and uh, and I work also with Shankar Sastri and and, uh, and others but the original uh, idea of doing sliding looking at these were actually as I said from from my work well, not my work my, my my teacher in France who was André Fossard who actually you know had uh, it just in his class, had talked about that, and I thought it was very exciting. And these were really not well-known techniques anywhere, including in the U.S. and so on. These were kind of obscure techniques, and nobody knew about it. He happened to know about them because he had interacted with a lot of these people in the Soviet Union. Very, very interesting. There will be certainly an episode about the interaction between the West, the Western world, and, and the and what Soviet was world. Interesting too is that, uh, in the sense, in the Soviet Union, because it's you know highly trained in mathematics, the, the fact that you had this 
at the time, this discontinuous switching, which, you know, what I didn't like, were got rid of in a, in a very simple way. But the fact you had this discontinuous switching was actually what they thought was interesting because they were mathematicians. You know, you could, uh, you pure mathematicians, you could say, well, you know, you can, uh, you can define uh, solutions which result from infinitely fast switching. And so on. there was somebody, uh, one of the big names was, was Filipov, who ended up being a minister of research in the Soviet Union and so on, you know, and, and, and Utkin and people like that. And, and they were fascinated by this switching. And, you know, if, but from an engineering point of view, you know, except for very rare kinds of system, the switching you don't want, you know. So, so that was the... So now uh, I'm curious, how did your interests shift from, say, sliding mode control towards uh, teleoperation, uh, robotic manipulation, and afterwards? So, so you know, that, that was, uh, so I did my thesis in 83, right? And people were starting to uh, do uh, robotics, you know, and so that was a very natural kind of application to use uh, for the reasons you mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. um, because you have these nonlinear systems and you cannot assume that you know everything, especially with a robot, you know, if you're picking up a load then, you know, uh, the dynamics changes significantly, especially if it's a good robot, like a direct drive robot and so on, right? Yeah, here I noted down a couple of papers that are quite important, uh, one of them being on the adaptive control of robot manipulators mm -hmm. with uh, Lee. Yeah, so that paper, uh, I think, had a major impact, you know, because uh, it, it basically it was introducing several ideas at the same time, you know, it was... Uh, so this was, uh, you know, that's why I was saying, you know, it's, it's not just me, it's with students. This is really joint work with Wei Ping, and he did a fantastic job. And, and uh, yeah, so, so basically there was this idea that the idea of a sliding variable replacing an nth order problem by first order problem, which you, the point being that you can use it also in adaptive control. We had done that actually earlier, a year earlier with a student named Joseph Coetzee, but for just uh, um, scalar systems, you know. So the when uh, when you get into uh, robots, these become multi-dimensional systems and so on, and you have to do more than that. Uh, so using the, the sliding idea, uh, using and the fact that, see here it's getting technical a little too, but you know, the, the inertia matrix of a robot is a positive definite matrix which allows to build it into a Lyapunov function, which is the, something that you want to do proofs and uh, proofs of convergence and so on. And so, so that was the, the second uh, aspect. And the, the third one was that you had conservation of energy. And conservation of energy allowed to do special kind of computations for, for those of uh, you familiar with that, the fact that the, the H dot minus 2C, the derivative of the inertia matrix minus the Coriolis matrix, had to be skew symmetric, uh, which was a matrix version of conservation of energy, which we proved actually. Now it's standard and they, they say that in textbooks in passing, but actually uh, I think we were the first to, to prove that in, in that paper. And that was itself inspired by brilliant work by a Japanese colleague of mine named Arimoto, who, you know, showed uh, in a little more complicated way that we ended up doing it, but, you know, showed that from physical reasons, uh, some very simple controllers could work for position control using basically conservation of energy. And here there are, of course, strong ties to the concept of passivity as well. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, passivity, uh, you know, uh, passivity is... Uh, is closely related to the notion of energy conservation. Is basically a uh, Lyapunov theory with with uh, with inputs, you know. And so we're definitely going to talk about that later when I hope we have a chance to really dig into the topic of contraction. But perhaps continuing on our chronological journey, I somehow noticed an interest, uh, you know, moving from adaptive control towards uh, neural networks and the brain. Uh, this happens pretty much in the 90s, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, beginning of the 90s and the mid-90s, definitely with a paper called Gaussian Networks for a Direct Adaptive Control, but also with many others. I'm curious about what sparked your interest in the brain. Well, you know, in the uh, I, in 19, I think, 86, I, I went to this big conference in San Diego where there was kind of uh, this neural network revival and everybody was... Uh, you know, there was uh, Hinton and Grosberg and Hopfield and all these people there. And they, uh, so there was kind of survival of neural networks, but uh, there they were no stability, convergence, proofs, or everything was kind of heuristic. And uh, it was very interesting. It was clearly very exciting, and there was a, clearly very, a lot of potential. 
uh, but people like me uh, with a kind of a more formal background, you know, were always wondering, you know, why does this work or when is this going to work, actually? The, the question at the time was that more why doesn't doesn't it work okay but <laughs> but it was more uh, you know trying to put some formal things in there and people like uh, Grossberg for instance had tried to do that for certain uh, for certain kinds of systems and we were trying to do that for motion control and robotics and, and stuff like that and so just to fix the ideas what was the the main idea in the paper Gaussian networks for the ah, okay so control? so the paper Gaussian network basically it took back the the ideas from the paper with Code C, I was mentioning uh, uh, just on adaptive nonlinear control, the paper with, with Weeping Lee on, uh, on adaptive robot control, uh, and just said, okay, so typically, well, in, in all of these papers, you had what's called basis functions. So in other words, the dynamics was composed of sums of terms, and each of these terms was always the product of an unknown parameter, like a mass or an inertia or something like that, time a known matrix which re- or known vector, which represented what you know about the physics of the system, okay? and the vector itself, dependent on the state and so on. And so what we wondered with, uh, with Rob Sanner was that, uh, what if we don't know these basis functions, right? Well, so you have these physical basis functions, but you could also have mathematical basis functions. You know, in the, in the absence of any uh, information, you could say, well, you know, I'm going to expand my function in terms of a weighted sum of coefficients times mathematical basis functions for a series of things like that, right? But it had to be done in an efficient way, you know? So we came up with this uh, way of using Gaussians because Gaussians are basically functions of compact support. In other words, they are basically zero outside of a certain region. And so when you start using them as basis functions, you're going to cover the whole state space with Gaussians, but you're going to use... At any instant, you're going to use only a few of them because all the others are basically zero. And so that was the idea. But also the, the idea was more prosaically, you know, that you had these neural networks and some things work, some things don't, didn't. But the key aspect for us that was that you had lots of parameters, so you could do, do lots of things, right? And so if we're trying to do things systematically with lots of parameters, doing this mathematical expansion was a very natural thing, right? But that also got me to then talk to uh, other people, some of which became some of my best friends, like Stefan Mala, uh, to to try to be uh, to say, well, you know, sums of Gaussians were, was nice. So this is probably an even better mathematical way to do things, perhaps wavelets or perhaps other things, you know. And uh, but the sums of Gaussian is still very uh, very current, and lots of people use that paper actually. So so what I found very interesting in this paper is that there is a small section where you talk about biological plausibility. Yep. So you, at the time, you were already aware of the relevance of this work in a biological context. So you, you literally say, although the intention in this paper is to derive stable adaptive controllers for nonlinear dynamic systems, intuitively the composite structure of the above control law is compatible with the observed movements of biological organisms. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 1996, uh, there is your first paper on uh, the neuroscience letters. So the intermediate cerebellum may function as a wave variable processor. So there is really a, a spike, if you wish, yes. in your interest in, so, in the brain. So, you know, we had done this work with Gunther Niemeyer, on, uh, another Berlin student, on um, teleoperation. Okay, And so in teleoperation, you have... A, at the time, it was called master slave. You know, so you have a, a manipulator and then a local manipulator, and you have a remote manipulator, and you're going to do things remotely. And uh, if you want to do things precisely remotely, you need some kind of force feedback. But if you have now, if you have this with, a, a, you, it means you have a feedback loop now between the local and the remote, and a pure delay in the feedback loop in both direction. Uh, which is a perfect recipe for instability. Okay. And so uh, what we had shown, uh, which was uh, inspired but also by some work of uh, Anderson and Spong, uh, we had shown that you could get the system to not naturally generate instabilities by making the transmission work like a flexible beam. And uh, mathematically, one very simple way to do that is that instead of transmitting through the transmission with the usual variables, 
like positions and velocities and so on, you transmitted composite variables, which were uh, mixtures of forces and, uh, and velocities. And doing so, you, uh, you mimicked uh, a transmission line uh, with, and the transmission line of passive transmission lines. So if you put a transmission line on the, on the table, it's not going to explode because there's no source of energy, right? And so that, that, that was this idea of uh, getting passivity which, as I mentioned, some early work had done, but using a, this idea of just sending the right variable through the transmission line. And it also started to be a little of a theme because the, the sliding variables were composite variables, were sums of variable, and these were different sums of variable that, you know, really helped. And we also... Uh, th there was an, another article, actually, where we... Uh, I talked at some at that time to uh, also uh, people in neuroscience, and they said, you know, uh, understanding motion control is very hard because you have this mess. Uh, what you measure, it's not clear if it's position, it's not clear if it's velocity. It seems to be kind of this mixture. You know, biology is dirty, and you know, my point was, no, no, it's it's not because it's dirty. It's because it's using the right composite variable, right? It's actually uh, simplifying things by doing things this way, you know. And so, because if you and so, so that's also led to that paper about the cerebellum and so on. So, but, but because if you think of it, right, from the brain to the hand is at least a tenth of a second for the the message to go, and similarly, the other way back, right? And so, you have very much this problem that you have in teleoperation with a pure delay. Okay. Incidentally, the the work we have done with Niemeyer was interesting for a different point of view. Is that it's very easy with a delay to get an instability even if the delay is really small. Conversely, using these wave variables and so on, with small delay, the delay becomes completely transparent. So, uh, so instead of you know, spending your time fighting the stability of the system, because you know, there's an operator on the other side, right? So you can, uh, but instead of uh, spending your time fighting the stability of the system, uh, you can have something which is naturally stable and at small delays is completely transparent. You know, so. That's fantastic. And is there also a message behind this that, you know, using these variables, we gain some predictive capability? Yeah, yeah. So then you can interpret these variables, right? So some of these variables are like predictions, and some of these variables kind of add damping, right? So, so you can interpret what these variables do. Uh, but um, yeah. Fantastic. And of course, I mean, the brain is dealing with uh, very slow components, right? So in other words, the brain is doing all these things, you know, uh, famous basketball players and so on are so much better than, uh, you know, robotic basketball players. But still, they're using brains where uh, neurons react about a million times slower than transistors, right? So humans are very good at real-time motion, although we're dealing with desperately so slow hardware, okay? And very energy efficient also in terms of... And very of energy efficient. So that's the other thing, right? So maybe we'll talk more about uh, learning, uh, deep learning and so on later on. But, uh, you know, so uh, when you do deep learning or things like that, you literally put batteries of computers near electric dams, right? Because you need so much energy. Uh, but the brain is using 20 watts, right? Which is much less than any uh, light bulb, right? Uh, so... And incredibly interesting, and we're definitely going to talk about that maybe towards the end of this uh, episode. But first, I would like to dig into perhaps one of your most important contributions. Uh, so in 1998, you published together with uh, Winfield Lumiller on contraction analysis for nonlinear systems. So here I think we owe to the audience a definition of what contraction is and perhaps even what stability is. Yeah. So Winfield was a super brilliant German student. And he had the very much uh, European training, as I had, actually. So, uh, you know, he happened to be really good at many, many things, and in particular at fluids. It was the time when I was starting to try to do catching with robots, you know, and we were trying to throw paper airplanes and catch them. And we realized there was no uh, way to build predictors or observers for nonlinear systems which were reliable. And you know, the idea of throwing a paper airplane is that it always flies differently and it can fly up or it can fly down, it can fly straight, and, and you want to be able to, uh, to predict that in real time. And realize there was like zero, uh, zero um, techniques to, to do that. And so we wondered with Winnie about Lyapunov, and Lyapunov was, as we mentioned a little earlier, 
Lyapunov theory, which for me, uh, Lyapunov theory is one of the most brilliant ideas the, in the history of science, right? But Lyapunov theory is based on, precisely because it's so simple, it's based on the idea of virtual physics, right? It's based on the idea of uh, basically creating mathematically something which could be interpreted as physics in some virtual world. But it's basically virtual mechanics, virtual kinetic energy and things like that. And so we wondered, you know, what if we try to do virtual fluids, right? So that was basically the original idea. And we started to do a little, uh, a bunch of, uh, you know, simple simulations where we used just the divergence of the system. So as simple as you can get for virtual fluids, and it already worked really well. So we started to build on that, you know, obviously the divergence, uh, which for the uh, aficionado is, is also the trace of the Jacobian, which is the, the sum of the eigenvalues of the Jacobian. The fact that the divergence is negative shouldn't be enough to guarantee that you always tend towards one trajectory. It just guarantees that volumes shrink. So we try to make it more explicit to show that, to give conditions in which any two trajectories of a system would tend towards a single trajectory. It didn't have to be an equilibrium, but it had to be in a trajectory, right? And also, so in a sense, it was a kind of Riemann joining forces with Lyapunov, right? Because we had uh, to define distances in the right way, and distances involves metrics. You know, uh, the original name of contraction actually was metric theory, and we changed it to contraction. So it's, it's very much uh, Riemann c coming to help to build Lyapunov-like functions, you know, like. This is incredibly interesting. I guess some intuition for the audience is that contraction guarantees that uh, small disturbances or uh, initial conditions are asymptotically forgotten. Mm -hmm. And the way it's defined, it's um, um, a concept that is defined in terms of the differential dynamics, right? So it's uh, small displacements. So we can situate this idea, I mean, in history as having as ancestors I would say the calculus of variations. Yeah, yeah, the calculus of, of variations. So originally, you know, we paid a lot of care of, uh, you know, we kept def defining these differential displacements and uh, and so on. And, uh, you know, we paid a lot of care saying, well, you know, these are well-defined mathematical objects and so on, because actually that's one of the reviews says, well, what are these things? You know, these are approximations? No, no, they're not approximations. They're just differential displacements. So these are these are exact relations, like... Uh, the, the, the way you say d cosine theta equal minus sine theta d theta, right? It's, it's an exact relation between differentials. This can be well-defined mathematically. This is actually what is used in the calculus of variation. And from our point of view, it's also what was used in fluids, right? That's exactly what you do all the time in fluids. Okay. So that's what we uh, so that's what we did, and it uh, you know it took a few iterations to get to the right formulations. But basically, uh, and uh, you know, in passing, it had. So, I must say, either we were lazy or modest, I'm not sure, uh, but there's a section in, uh, in that paper where we give extensions, and each of these extensions is put as a remark. And after that, pa people wrote entire papers on this single remark. You know? so for instance, we show that if you have a contracting system driven by a periodic input, then you tend towards an, uh, a state of the same period. And uh, it's very easy to show, but it's, uh, it shows also the power of the formulation, you know, so it's, uh, but it's funny. Uh, uh, so lots of people took these very remarks and then wrote papers. We showed also that the way we define uh, contraction was based on the Euclidean norm, but you could pick other norms, one norms or infinity norms and so on, and you got equivalent uh, definitions of contraction, but some of which may be easier to compute in some context, you know. I have lots of questions in this respect. I mean, uh, maybe one of provocative question is uh, why somehow the framework of contraction, so why working on tangent spaces, so, uh, why is it possible that we can study nonlinear phenomena in such an easy way through essentially linear techniques? Mm -hmm. So why is it? Yeah, so that's, we, we wonder about that, especially, you know, uh, Winnie, of course, had taken uh, my class and, uh, you know, one of the things, any nonlinear systems the class says, you know, says, well, nonlinear is very different from linear, you know, uh, uh, if you take a linearization at a point, it doesn't tell you what the nonlinear system is doing. So we wondered about that, but then we quickly realized, actually, the key is that it's not linearization at a point, it's linearization everywhere. It's linearization everywhere. So it's it's as if, 
you know, you take a, a function and I give you the slope everywhere and I give you the value of the function at the point. And of course, you know the entire function. It's not the same thing as giving you the value of the point and the slope at a point. It's the value of the function at some point and the slope everywhere. And here it's, so it's based on the Jacobian everywhere. So from that point of view, that was not a mystery. It's just, just based on that. But the fact it was still based on linearization allowed to use a lot of matrix algebra and so on that you normally don't use in, in, in nonlinear control. Okay. And so that was the, yeah. This very problem actually has some history in control itself. Like we all, uh, uh, some people know at least about the Kalman conjecture. So if I have a, a system, a linear system, and I have a feedback, uh, some kind of nonlinearity, and I take the derivative of this nonlinearity and I postulate that the overall resulting system is stable for every nonlinear gain in a certain, let's say, with certain bounds then the conjecture was that you can actually prove stability. And this conjecture was disproved. Yes. But somehow here the intuition is that if you work with the state really, and you work with the Jacobian everywhere, then you're capable of showing a much stronger condition. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because it, precisely because you work with the state, you know. Uh, for instance, it's not like passivity, which is an input-output thing and so on. So it's really fundamentally a function of the state. And it's using the fact that, uh, you know, you have this common metric everywhere. And so the equations end up linear, to be linear in the metric. But they do involve the time derivative of the metric, which itself depends on the state and so on, right? So Perhaps shifting gears, or again on the topic of contraction, but shifting gears in the sense that so far we've only talked about stability. But uh, most problems of interest out there are actually away from equilibrium. And so Ilya Prigogine, uh, Nobel Prize in, in chemistry in 1977, says that entropy is the price of structure. So I'm wondering what is the relationship between contraction and thermodynamics or in general contraction and instability? Okay, so it's funny you ask that. So let's start with instability. Okay, so one of the, uh, often when I talk, give general talks about contraction, I talk precisely about instability and in saying, well, you know, there's lots of cases where you want instability, but the fact that you have contraction analysis gives you a much more precise way of understanding, you know, what are the limits of stability and so on. So uh, of mastering instability. So I think control instability is really important, right? If you have a military aircraft, uh, these military aircraft move very quickly because basically their center of mass is very close to their center of lift. So they, they nearly unstable or some of them are frankly unstable. And because of that, you can basically throw them into an instability and then catch them through control, and it can go really fast, okay? I had mentioned Gunther Niemeyer. We did a, another paper on how to open an unknown door, you know, because we were tired of having, seeing these papers where you had, uh, you know, uh, groups of engineers uh, working really hard to open an unknown door with a robot. And uh, if, you try, if you think of it, if you grab a, a door handle and try to open the door, it should be very easy because the door is a one-dimensional object. It moves in one direction. And so if you create an instability, which is very easy, it's x dot equal x, right? If you create an instability, then you're going to move in the right direction. You don't need to know exactly, it could be a hatch. You don't need to know exactly its position, its, its orientation, and so on. Just creating this instability, you'll move in the right direction. It, and it really works really well. Okay, uh, so that's another case where exploiting instability is, is important and, and makes things uh, easier. Um, we had done also some work with uh, Randy Douglas and uh, Uli Hutishauser on graph coloring. Okay. And here, this was more in the style of machine learning in the sense we have a good idea why it works, but we haven't proved formally why things work. But suppose you're trying to do graph coloring so uh, you have a graph and you're trying to have each node of the graph to be of uh, colors different from its neighbor. Okay. And you can show mathematically, uh, you can always do that with four colors, but uh, you know, how, how do you do it? What's the algorithm? So there, there are very complicated ways to do that. And we just tried something based on instability, which really worked really well, uh, which was when uh, you know, each of the nodes was a, a winner take all. So in other words, it chose a color. And it kind of pushed the others' nodes away. Okay, it just 
it chose a color and pushed it, and the node, the other node, was also choosing its color and pushing the others away, and so on. And this actually, you you converge very very quickly to a solution to the graph coloring problem. Okay, again, exploiting instability. Okay, it's fantastic. This is kind of a uh, an opposite problem of synchronization, almost. Yes, it's, it's exactly the opposite problem of synchronization. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're absolutely right. And so the relation of Prigogine, it's was funny that you mentioned that. I, I met Prigogine, I uh, had the long talks with, uh, well, not long talk, at least one long talk with Prigogine a long time ago. And uh, Prigogine was one of my heroes when I was, uh, just before I came to uh, the US, actually, because uh, I was very, very interested in self-organization and non-equilibrium systems uh, and things like that. And, and this notion of entropy production. Uh, but so, but if you, if you look at... Uh, the results, you know, you have this interesting results, which says that basically, if you have systems uh, away from equilibrium, but still in some kind of linearized range, then they minimize entropy production. Okay, so it's kind of a general law, but it's a very, it applies to only a very, very specific kind of system in a very small range. And then Prigogine and Nicolis and Landsdorf uh, tries to extend these results to the general case, and then they have this rather inelegant, which they recognize themselves, extremely inelegant uh, condition, which it's a mathematical condition that doesn't mean anything physical, you know. It's funny because actually, currently we, we're doing uh, PD versions of contraction with a very good uh, math undergrad, and we're trying to solve exactly that problem. Okay? We're trying to, 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 which I'm not, I'm pretty sure we won't because, you know, this is a, has been an outstanding problem for 50 years, you know, what is the generalization of this Prigogine relation, but, you know, using contraction and stuff like that. Absolutely fascinating. Absolutely. Um, maybe one thing that we should mention about contraction is that it has a lot of nice properties. So mm -hmm. uh, it is modular. I guess that's perhaps the most important yeah, property. Yeah, it's, it's modular because it applies to non-autonomous systems. So in other words, it applies to systems with inputs. Mm -hmm. And because it applies to a system of input, you can play Lego with it. You know, you can start putting things together. Uh, and so it has very nice modularity properties. You can build very large contracting systems out of simpler elements by using some simple rules, basically. And this actually, when we developed that at about the same time, at literally at about the same time, actually, uh, there were biologists uh, at Harvard, who uh, Mark Kirshner notably, who were developing this idea of facilitated variation. The idea that in biology, there are core components like DNA replication or sexual replication, things which have been fine-tuned for, for a long, long time and then stayed more or less the same, like DNA replication, for instance. And that evolution is working basically on how you connect these things. Okay. And it's very, very much the same message as contraction, right? So you have these building blocks and then you're going to connect them and you're going to create this, these, uh, these large systems. And you just have to make sure that how you connect these building blocks verify some simple rules uh, that guarantee contraction of the entire system. And so actually, we, we have a paper this year in, in NeurIPS uh, called RNNs of RNNs, you know, where we do exactly that. You know, we, we do a contraction analysis of individual uh, recurrent neural networks. And then we just pick lots of these networks and we connect to them. We just learn the connections. Uh, and actually, we, we get to state of the art and some uh, standard uh, test problems, you know, just doing that. Yeah, I guess modularity is really a key property because then it allows you to go across scales, the same reason across scales. Yeah, yeah, it, it allows you to go across scales. Uh, it's, of course, fundamentally something that nature uses, right? For all the good reasons that, for instance, Herbert Simon explained and, uh, you know, for people who don't know Herbert Simon is, uh, is both a Nobel laureate in economics and one of the founders of AI. And he has this very, very famous paper called The Architecture of Complexity, where he explains the role of modularity, the, mo the role of multiple time scales too. Yeah, maybe in closing on the topic of contraction, I thought we should mention also the companion paper, Modularity, Evolution and the Binding Problem, yep. where you do relate the concept of contraction to really somehow its biological uh, both motivation and application, is that fair to say? Yes, yes. So, so that, that's, uh, that came out of a series of lectures I gave at the Collège de France that year and uh, the, uh, on trying to, to, to start understanding the brain from the point of view of dynamical systems, right? And the binding problem is, uh, you know, you, uh, 
when you you look at a scene or whatever, some parts of uh, your brain are processing vision, and the, these parts are themselves some different subparts processing edges and colors and so on, and some parts are processing sound and so on. And so different parts of your cortex, in that case, are processing different parts of what's going on. But at the same time, you know that all these parts, uh, you know, are talking about common event. Okay, what you see corresponds to what you hear, and so on. Okay, and so that's called the, the binding problem. You know, how is this done? Okay, and you know, we showed a, a possible mechanism, if you want, on how it's done. We also did that in, in the paper with Quang Fam, you know, on synchronization and things like that. But also on the topic of contraction, there was an extra idea which uh, we did with Wang Wei. Uh, and f again, for the aficionados, those we, we talked uh, about uh, in the pa contraction paper, we talk about virtual displacement, which is the term used in, in fluids. But later on, we call them differential displacements, not virtual displacement, because the term virtual we used for something else, which was this paper uh, with Wang Wei, which was talking about synchronization of oscillators or dynamical systems in general. But the, the idea is actually quite simple, but we think quite powerful and fits very well with contraction. The, the idea is that, for instance, if you take two oscillators, two identical oscillators, and you're trying to show that they synchronize. So neither of the oscillators is contracting because if you pick arbitrary and initial conditions, you end up on the limit cycle, but you know you will not catch up. The trajectories won't catch up with each other on the limit cycle. So neither of them is contracting. But the idea is that you can exhibit a virtual mathematical system. You can construct a virtual mathematical system which is contracting and happens to have these two trajectories as particular solutions. And because these two trajectories happen to be particular solutions of this virtual contracting system, they have to tend towards one another. In other words, the two oscillators have to synchronize. Okay, so it was it was a very simple idea, but it allowed to use a, to be a, do a big jump in the applications of contraction, if you want, because you were not just doing convergence to a common trajectory; you're starting to be applying it to synchronization and so on for systems which are not contracting, but you're using contraction to show synchronization. Yeah, so literally it's using contraction in order to converge to attractors that are more general yes, than uh, exactly. a particular trajectory. Exactly, but we're using this idea of a virtual system. So in other words, the, the proofs end up being very simple. You know, the, so you consider this virtual system, obviously it has these two systems, this particular solution, and obviously it's contracting, so these two solutions tend towards another, right? I am familiar with that proof. It's essentially where you show that for sufficiently, either sufficiently strong coupling or whether the system contains sufficiently many uh, agents, let's call them agents, then essentially you achieve uh, yes, exactly. convergence. But the sufficiently strong coupling happened to be small, right? So in other words, it's not for infinite coupling, you know, so you can get a minimal bound for which this happens, you know. And this was a result I had a hard time convincing my mathematician's friends, although they saw the proof was correct, right? But they didn't, because basically a lot of the work which had been done before on synchronization was always near the limit cycle, right? And you never had these kind of global results. And this sounded too simple to be correct, but actually it was correct. It was like, yeah, because in general, it's a, it's a hard problem. Yeah, so I, I won't say who it was, but you know, said, Jean-Jacques, think, you know, it can't be true. It says, well, you know. <laughs> Turns out it is. Actually, this is a good assist for maybe the next topic. So in the years uh, 2010, more or less, you start focusing on synchronization. Mm -hmm. And there's an, another important paper, in my opinion, uh, called How Synchronization Protects from Noise. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a a topic that is worth spending some time on. So okay. what, what does that mean? Basically, a lot of things that you do in science, especially in neuroscience and so on, have to do with taking average measurements. Like in the brain, you know, if you do fMRI, it's actually, you know, a spatial averaging of a lot of things, right? But the notion that averaging is a good thing and in particular, it cleans up the noise. Well, so fMRI comes from the technology, but the fact that people assume that averaging is a good thing comes from a linear point of view. If you have a linear, if you measure, uh, uh, if you have uh, signals, each of which has noise, and you take an average, then you clean up the noise, okay? And if you take linear dynamical systems and you drive them, with signals which have noise and you average the output, you also clean up the noise. But if you take nonlinear dynamical systems and drive them with input with have noise, you don't clean up the noise. 
you, you get a signal that looks reasonably clean, but has no relation to what you're hoping to get, which is the noise-free signal. And so what this paper was showing is that, so you have these basic systems, you, you drive them with inputs plus noise, you take the average at the end, it doesn't work because the systems are nonlinear. However, if you synchronize the systems and then take the average, now you're cleaning up the noise, okay? So in other words, the fact that these networks now work as a team allows to get for nonlinear systems the noise averaging properties you would expect for linear systems. But of course, you can ask the question in reverse. So it's saying, well, you know, so we're taking fMRI and we assuming that it means something. And actually it does, because it does cor correlate to behavior and so on and so on. So it probably means there is a synchronization phenomenon in, in the things we're measuring, because we know if, well, that's not probably the only possibility, but it's the most plausible possibility, right? That there is a synchronization phenomenon which allows this average signal to actually be meaningful. Okay, so that's the... One here could also speculate that that's also how biological systems work in general. So how do they function so reliably out of components that are in general not so robust? Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, and between neurons, for instance, you have the usual uh, uh, synaptic connections, but you also have electrical signals and, and all sorts of things. Right? So. In the same years, I guess this somehow motivated you to think of networks. You managed to get the cover article of nature. I yeah. wonder whether you are the only person in control who managed to do that, or is there anybody else? I haven't else? checked, but I, I, I believe so. <laughs> I believe so. And it was on the controllability of networks, you know, and uh, and actually I sent the paper to Rudy Kalman, who was uh, still alive at the time, you know, and said, you know, it took 50 years, but it was about time, you know, <laughs> that, uh, you know, controllability is finally on the co cover of nature. You know? So how, how did you manage to do that? And also, what is the paper about? Basically, uh, my uh, colleague and friend, L Lashul Barabasi, moved to, to Boston. And we were saying, well, you know, it would be fun to, to start doing something together. So uh, he didn't know anything about control. So I started explaining some basic things about control. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, the basic questions are controllability, well understood for linear systems, and so on. It would be fun if we could do controllability of network. And Laszlo said, well, you know, it, it's, it's plausible that we could do something because after all, this is just an algebra question and networks are very good at that. And, and so, but we, we thought by the end of this lunch, we thought it would be interest. Well, we, we thought it would be nice to do, but trivial because uh, it would probably end up being hubs. Okay, the question of whether which nodes you need to control to control the entire thing would probably be the most connected uh, uh, systems and uh, which are called the hubs, right? And uh, that would be it. And people would say, yeah, fine. But we actually very quickly realized actually by the evening uh, that this was not the case at all. Because if you have hubs, which are, uh, they create symmetries. And because they create symmetries, it means that you cannot independently control the other nodes. So you don't want hubs at all. You want something else. Okay. And so then we uh, we hired a, a postdoc. Uh, well, more precisely, Laszlo had this postdoc who just came uh, came to his lab. And so we asked him to work on this uh, very, very good uh, postdoc named Yang Liu. And so he did most of that work. And Laszlo is extremely good at writing papers. So he, he did, did a very beautiful writing of this paper. And so when it was accepted in Nature, and it was accepted as a full article, which was funny because Laszlo had other articles in Nature, but it was his first full article, so he was very proud of that. Uh, we said, well, you know, for me, it was my first article in Nature. And so we said, well, you know, we might as well try to get the cover. So we, we worked hard to uh, get the right picture and the right background to get the cover, and we did got, to get the cover, which was fun. It's more, for, it's more you might as well. You know, so. And I should mention that you also got the cover of the Proceedings of National yeah, Academy yeah, exactly. of Sciences. Yeah, exactly. So when we wrote Observability <laughs> and uh, we didn't so have to do any work to do, they, they gave us the cover, which is fine. Which was fine. No, one, one sentence that I really loved from this abstract was, uh, from the abstract of the previous paper, was that the ultimate proof of our understanding of natural or technological systems is reflecting in our ability to control them. Yes. So Feynman would have said to build them, but yeah. you actually advocate to control them. That's which right. Is uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, and I, I think, you know, I'm not sure who wrote the sentence, probably Laszlo, actually. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, another consequence I would say that is worth spending time on of this paper is that you manage to connect something that very much has to do with graph theory with questions that are very much control theoretic. So the matching problem and controllability of yep. a network. Yep. Um, and what I found very fascinating was that as a consequence of this paper, ablation studies had been done on uh, C, C. elegans, this, yes. uh, this yes. worm, in order to study its locomotory properties essentially and how to pinpoint what are the neurons that are involved in locomotion of this uh, nematode. Yes. And somehow you managed to predict that out of a network that is pretty considerably big, all of the neurons that are involved in locomotion and even find a new one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that this is really an incredible case study that shows the power of what control still has to say on so many different topics. Yeah. I also wanted to mention on the, the context of synchronization, there was a, one extra idea which was also very biological, uh, but turned out to be, I thought, very interesting, which came from bacterial uh, biology. When you have uh, work in particular by Bonnie Bassler. When you have a bacterium, suppose it's a bad bacterium, it's trying to uh, bother its host or kill its host. To, to do that, it needs to replicate. And because if it's by itself, it's not going to do anything. Uh, so it needs to replicate. And at some point when there's enough of them, they, they switch the behavior and they get into a more aggressive uh, behavior towards the host. And uh, the question is, how do they know there's enough of them? You know, nobody is supervising what's going on, okay? And so uh, they know because they send chemicals in the environment, which are called autoinducers. Each of them sends a chemical, and each of them measures the total amount. And that way, uh, they can know how many they are and so on. But of course, it's also a very nice form of synchronization, because you can show it's a one line a proof that if you're trying to, uh, if you have sub elements and you're trying to connect them all to all, an equivalent way of doing that is to create a common signal, which is basically the sum and sending back to everybody else. So computationally, it's very efficient because instead of having a order n square connections, as you connect all to all, you implement the exact same computation with only order n connection. So it's a very interesting computer science idea, if you want, that the bacteria found. Uh, but also it allows to, to build, uh, to understand how things synchronize very, very simply using this idea of a virtual system. Okay? So that's, you know, this kind of quorum sensing idea uh, we used a lot after that. So it's a way to count, essentially, count each other. It's a way to count and it's a way to synchronize, you know, using the environment. And, and we showed later on uh, with a paper with colleagues at Sanford, uh, Max Schwager and his group, that uh, you know, when, when you do robotic manipulation of a common object, you can use exactly the same idea where the common object serves as the environment. And it becomes a synchronization problem. Maybe we should shift gears and now come to your most recent work. So lately you've been shifting your interests towards, I would say, optimization and machine learning, and mm -hmm. somehow even going back to the origins where you were interested in adaptive control. So what are the, what keeps you busy these days? Yeah, so, so the bridge with machine learning. So we started doing that with Rob Sanner, of course, but now there's, uh, there's many more things happening in machine learning. I just want to mention, just to wave the flag, that uh, you know one of my heroes in control theory is Brian Anderson, who is a famous Australian uh, control theorist to do a lot of work in, uh, in adaptive control. And the latest algorithms on uh, deep learning, which are based on score-based diffusion, are directly inspired by a paper he wrote in 1982, okay? so it's, which is, of course, in the references. But it's, it's, it's actually it's very interesting that uh, you know, he wrote this paper in, in 1982, and now it's used to, to have uh, these systems where, where you say, you know, uh, draw me a dog in a sushi house. And, uh, draws you a dog in a sushi house and it's uh, and it's fundamentally using Brian's paper actually so um, yes we, we started doing uh, things with uh, with Sanner and of course I mean even when I was uh, interested about Prigogine I was interested in physics of life and stuff like that right uh, but now there's so many things happening with uh, with machine learning it's so it's, things are going so fast and uh, and for me this interaction with Google was fantastic because uh, you know uh, 
first of all, it's a lot of young people, so you you, you feel uh, more excited uh, because of that. And, uh, you know, it's really kind of reminded me of Bell Labs and, the, you know, the, the excitement that everybody has with a lot of resources at the same time. Okay. And so, so you have all of these algorithms and you're trying to make them... Um, one way to, to say this is, okay, when you're taking an airplane, the airplane is rated at 10 to the minus 9, which means that there's only one chance in a billion that something will go really wrong in the next hour. Okay, the whole thing is rated at 10 to the minus 9. Now, how would you like to board an airplane and somebody would say, well, welcome aboard, you'll be happy to know that uh, the control system for this airplane was designed using the latest neural networks. And as a result, we have a 96% chance to actually land in San Francisco. Uh, that wouldn't be... So the, the question is, you know, how can you start building guarantees around these things, you know? And of course, it's not just guarantees, it's how can you make them more efficient, you know? These, uh, you know, there's a question of data efficiency. How many examples do you need to, to distinguish a lion from a dog, you know? And a, a little girl needs two, right? But uh, uh, a, a machine needs much more, okay? So both understanding questions of, you know, what kind of guarantees uh, can you give? You know, the, the words these days are certificates, right? Uh, what kind of guarantees can you give? But also, I think uh, even more interesting, you know, how can you make them much more powerful, much faster, much more efficient, much more data efficient? I have many questions in, in this area. I mean, perhaps one would be, Again, biology will play a role, you think, in... in Sorry? Will biology play a role, you think, in uh, uh, yeah, so, becoming more efficient? Uh, possibly. Uh, we have to remember, though, that... So I think so, first of all. But we have to remember that in evolution, the, the brain spent a lot of time fighting the fact it was dealing with these very slow components, right? So, uh, so time delays are very fundamental in what the brains are doing, to transmission delays, computation delays, and so on. And so in machines, we have much less of this problem. So, of course, we should be inspired by the brain because there's lots of uh, really good ideas in there and so on, but it's not clear that uh, we're really solving the same problems. Okay. So, yes, yeah, so, so I think biology will have a role, but it's important to realize that its constraints were different. Okay. Another question that I have is, what is the role of contraction in optimization? Yeah, so uh, so we, we, we did this paper with uh, Patrick Wensing uh, recently, uh, where we kind of looked at just gradient descent from a contraction point of view. Okay. Uh, paper is called Beyond Convexity because a lot of time the reflex when you you try to say, well, you know, have gradient descent, when will it converge? Well, let's say it will converge if the function is convex. Okay, fine. But actually, this is a set of measures zero uh, in the set of uh, all the functions that will converge because what you can very easily show that if you have gradient descent and you're trying to impose that this gradient descent is contracting in an identity metric, then you get exactly the condition that the function is convex. But it could be contracting in any metric and it would still tend to a unique equilibrium point, which would have to be in a minimum. So in other words, when you say, does my gradient descent converge? A sufficient condition is not that it's convex, it's clearly sufficient, but uh, a much, much uh, more general sufficient condition is that it's contracting in some metric, which doesn't have at all to be identity. Okay. So that's kind of the first point. The second point, of course, is that because you can use contraction, then you can start building combinations of these things, you know, series and feedback and, and so on. And in some sense, you know, uh, Backprop is, is, a common, is, a, is a hierarchy of such gradients, right? Uh, it's a series of such gradients, and things like reinforcement learning are more, uh, or uh, adversarial learning are very much a feedback version of some, such gradients. Okay. And then we, we showed this thing, which we thought was kind of amusing. Uh, I hadn't played much with semi-contraction. In other words, uh, even with, uh, with Winnie and so on, we hadn't played much with that. Um, uh, by, by the way, uh, aside the point, I must say I'm, I'm honored that uh, uh, I had a very few students because I, I, don't, I, hate, uh, I hate writing grants and so on. Uh, so I had very few students, but I'm honored that a lot of them are interested in still working with me years after that. And so we still work with, uh, with, uh, with Winnie and so on, for instance. Uh, but 
Getting back to that uh, point, we had very rarely looked at semi-contraction. So what's semi-contraction? It's when the distance between the two trajectories does not increase. Okay? It doesn't mean it decreases, but it doesn't increase. And you know you can you can write it in terms of contraction instead of having a contraction rate, which is uh, you have zero. Okay, so it's very uh, very easy. And uh, so what we wondered with uh, Patrick Wensing is um, so suppose you have a gradient system which is semi-contracting in some metric. Okay, so in other words, you know that uh, the distances between any two trajectories in that metric do not increase. What can you say? And you can show that, so you have this gradient system, it's semi-contracting in some metric, you can show that automatically it will tend towards a global minimum, that this global minimum will, in general, of course, not be unique, but that all global minima will be path-connected. And so, in other words, if you have a gradient system contracting in some metric, you, ha you get exactly the topology that you get in deep learning. In other words, you have lots of solutions, good solutions in these very over-parameterized systems. And all these good solutions are connected by paths which are also good solutions. Okay, and so, and you get that simply by imposing that the system is semi-contracting and symmetric, which of course gets to conjecture, which I'm not sure is correct or not, but that in these over-parameterized system, it's reasonably easy to get a metric that verifies this condition because, of course, you have a very large dimension, dimensional system and the, the metric varies as n square, right? So, so, uh, so the, there's a conjecture, if you want, I'm not sure it's correct, but there's, there's really a conjecture, that uh, as you, you get into the very high dimensional system, this condition that the system is contracting in some metric becomes easier and easier to verify. And that's, therefore, why you have all these deep learning things at work. It's very, very interesting and very fascinating. I don't really have a, a complete intuition about this. Maybe, can you help us, I don't know, with an analogy, try to, to digest why this is the case? Uh, no, no, I don't, uh, as I say, it's a conjecture, right? Mm -hmm. But, okay. but it, it, it's, it's interesting to see if you just say, I have a gradient or a natural gradient system, and, I, um, and just impose semi-contraction in some metric, then I get exactly the topology of uh, equilibrium and so on. I get in deep learning, you know, uh, which and people have noted but don't know how to prove, right? And I was just asking, in terms of ideas that intuitively help us showing that semi-contraction implies this path connectedness, is uh, that well, related it, to LaSalle? It, it, it's really the proof, right? So, so in other words, suppose that, suppose that you have two equilibria and you start with a, a path between the two equilibria, which is not an equilibrium path, just a path, and you'll just let it deform through the dynamics. Then it will, you'll end up having a deformed path uh, between the two equilibria, and you can show it will tend towards a steady state. And at the steady state, the gradient is zero, which means that the cost on all the path has to be the same, and therefore they're all global minima. Okay. And you can show that semi-contraction basically guarantees that as you take this original path and uh, let it uh, transform, things don't split. Um, maybe, you know, moving towards the end of this episode. Uh, another question that I really like to ask to our guests is advice to future generations. So if you were a student today, what would you invest on? Oh, uh, invest on, uh, well, I'm not sure about advice to future generations, uh, but... Uh, you know, I mean, the, the obvious thing to say, which I guess uh, we'll, we'll get from everywhere, is that you should pick up something that you're really interested in. You know, you should pick up something that uh, that you're keen to work on, uh, you know, on weekends and things like that, right? Um, you shouldn't care at all what uh, other people say, uh, because uh, generally, uh, you know, uh, contraction, as in many things, right, uh, went through the process of, you know, people saying it's wrong, then it's trivial. Then I invented it, right? Uh, so, and it's it's something very uh, it's uh, something you you see all the time in uh, in in all all cases. So I, I would pick you know things things that you're really interested in. My particular bias, but I'm not sure I should advise give this advice to young people today. But my particular bias is that you shouldn't worry much about funding. I never did. Okay. Uh, as a result, I had very, very few students. Uh, a lot of them were actually self-supported. They had grants from the country or things like that. 
Uh, but as a result, I never spent time in Washington trying to convince uh, people of, who didn't have the background uh, that uh, uh, what I was doing was uh, was interesting. So I'm not sure if I have any record but uh, of anything, but if I had a record, it would probably be the number of citations per dollar because the number the dollar is generally zero. Okay? So, uh, so uh, that I would recommend, or at least, you know, try to carefully select students and I was very lucky with the few students I worked on who are all super brilliant and uh, and and really do work okay don't spend time writing grants and so on but that's my point of view okay that's uh... well uh, Jean-Jacques it's been a pleasure to have you on our show thank you so much thank you very much for inviting me thank pleasure you. too thank you for listening I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.